Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. My name is Shadeed Muhammad, and I want to welcome you all to the Maradiyya show, where we are meeting Muslims where they are. Today's topic is about something that is uh, an ancient tradition that predates Islam and is becoming increasingly relevant today in this era of sexual revolution where everyone is fighting for their rights to uh, <coughs> express their own sexual orientation, including Muslims. And the topic that I'm referring to is that of polygyny. And this is something that predates Islam, and it's something that was allowed and permissible in just about every God-made religion. And I said God-made to separate it from man-made religion. And in, in recent times, there have been a lot of information coming to the Muslim community as well as the uh, communities of other faith about the issues of polygyny. As Muslims are not the only ones that practice polygyny, you have various sects from Christianity and other religions that practice polygyny. Um, but very little information uh, has come to us beyond the four corners of, or the four walls of Islamic information. We tend to only take from Islamic sources and that's it, and totally dismiss information that may be more pertinent, or poignant to the Muslims from other faiths. So today, inshallah ta'ala, I have with me my guest. Uh, he wrote a very you know, interesting but controversial uh, piece or article about um, the issue of polygyny. And the title of it was Why Muslim Women Are Opposed to Polygyny and Why Muslim Men Should Not Basically Argue With That Point. And my guest today is Brother Gaddith Bryan. Jazakumullahu khairan for coming on the show. Inshallah uh, ta'ala. I want to start off by talking a little bit about, you know, how you, how long ago have you been Muslim? When did you embrace Islam? And what are you doing currently? Because we talked earlier, earlier a little bit about your profession and what you're into now, as in terms of school. Uh, how long have you been Muslim? Um, I've been Muslim since I was 15. I'm currently 30, 33 years old now. I'm currently in medical school for a medical program known as. Okay. I've been Muslim since I was 15, I'm 33 years old now, and I'm currently in medical school, a medical program that specializes in hospital chaplaincy and psychotherapy. Okay. Now, like we discussed earlier, what that basically entails is that for clinical chaplains or hospital chaplains, psychotherapists, what we basically do is that when we encounter or visit patients or residents in hospitals or nursing homes, most of the time people, they just think that chaplains are there to just pray for people or to... Um, try to tell them things are okay, right? So our job as clinical uh, chaplains or hospital chaplains or psychotherapists is not to try to fix people. Because we know that the condition of a person can only be changed relative to a law willingly changing the condition of a person. And as the law says, the final law says, a law does not change the condition of a people unless they change within themselves. So our job is to help people journey with them, to empower them to change what is in themselves with the hopes that Allah will um, as a result of that change. Uh, seems a little bit like what we do as imams, right? <laughs> Help people along that in their be journey. The case. That should be the case, right. Right. So um, this this article that you wrote, um, you be, being involved in the profession, and what made you decide to write an article, um, very interesting, I must say, as well as uh, controversial. What, what made you decide to tackle a topic of, of that magnitude, um, you know, considering the profession that you're in? I mean, is it something that you saw going on in the Islamic community, or was it something that you felt the need that you had to speak on? Well, um, when I first came and count, uh, encountered with what polygyny is and how people abuse the practice of polygyny, I began to be very bothered by it. And I noticed that people, they would, they would complain and moan about the issue, but no one really 
uh, forthrightly spoke about the issue and tackled the issues surrounding the mispractice, the malpractice, I should say, of collision. Because unfortunately, it's well known that in the Muslim community, not just in the United States, not just in non-Muslim countries, not just in the Western world, but it, it's a global pathology mm -hmm. of the malpractice of po what polygyny, referring to what it is, how it should be practiced, and how it is not practiced. So, I mean, people write articles about polygyny all the time, both Muslim and non-Muslim. However, the angle that I took, it's very evident that no one really took that angle before. Okay. Or not that I've noticed. So, I mean, obviously we'll get into the angle that I Absolutely. chose to tackle. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, jotted, I, I, I jotted down some, some quotes from your article. Um, and I want to, you know, just look at the, the first thing. You said that... Um, and I'm going to read it in quotes because this is your words. You said, rather, the, the true reason why many Muslim women are growing unwillingly, unwilling to agree to their respective husbands to have multiple wives is simply because they genuinely believe that they were not even deserving of this. So basically you're saying that Muslim women feel or are opposed to their husbands taking on another wife or multiple wives because they feel that their husbands don't deserve it. I, I want you to t kind of elaborate on that because I myself was a little taken aback a little bit by that comment and I really wanted to hear from you because the best person to explain and interpret the their words mouth, is so the person speak, right? from the author's mouth. Right. Absolutely. Right. So like I said, I know people personally, I know people personally who um, have tried to enact polygyny or, or were in a polygynous relationship and they've actually confided it in me as to how difficult that process really is and how much work one has to go through. Because a lot of people, they think that it's just something that's very easy to fulfill. You know, so a lot of people, they're driven by some sexual agenda, but they're not driven by the Islamic agenda, right? Because we know Allah says in the Quran, al right? okay. men, are, men are responsible for women. But you find very often is that a lot of brothers, right? And again, this is not a stab at the Western world, Muslims in the Western world, Muslims in New York City, it's, it's a global problem. You find that a lot of Muslim men, they're not responsible, they're not a wa'amuna, they, they don't uphold the responsibilities that are set forth Islamically referring to their duties to their wives and husbands. Let me stop you right there. Uh, you, you mentioned that, um, that, that most of the motives are driven sexually and not Islamically, right? Aren't some of the motives uh, for taking another wife sexually? I mean, well, that's that's just something natural because we know the word nikah in the Arabic language literally means sexual intercourse, right? Right. So we know that that's that's an obvious French benefit of marriage. <laughs> that's that's something fairly <laughs> obvious, right? It's, you know, okay. even to the extent where if a marriage is not sexually consummated, it's an no, right? So we know that that's an integral part of a marriage. But a lot of people, unfortunately, that's their only ambition. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So that's one of the benefits, but that's not the objective. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And you, you, you mentioned that the, uh, the men, the Muslim men here, uh, let's, let's just talk about America right. without going beyond those bounds. The Muslim men are not kawama, you know, as Allah uses in, in the verse. Arijal uh, kawamuna That men are the protectors, maintainers, and every other word that the word kawama signifies. Um, how can you make such a broad statement that the, the Muslim men here are not kawama, which is what makes them undeserving? How could you make such a broad statement? I mean, it, it, it seems like you're kind of painting Muslim men with one brush, which Muslim men would kind of, I had to play the devil's advocate here, they would probably be offended. Um, and I think you used the word earlier, and I want you to kind of elaborate on that. You know, how is a Muslim man who is interested in polygyny, how is he to view your comment? Well, I mean, you know, to be honest, I mean, you're free to view the article however you feel. That's your choice, right? But from my vantage point, this is what I chose to speak about because this is what I've chosen to project based on people's viewpoints. Because, like, I've had discussions with various types of people, and one of the things, one of the reasons why I've come to that conclusion is that, like you said, just marginalizing into the Western world, non Muslim countries, New York City, whatever, right? There's been many cases, too many cases, of brothers taking multiple wives and these brothers having their wives on public assistance, right? Now, last time I checked, if any woman who is married 
to a Muslim, there's no justification for her to be on public systems of any kind. Because a lot doesn't say welfare are the maintainers of women. A lot doesn't say a welfare check is the maintainers of women. A lot says men are responsible for women, not a government program. Mm -hmm. So when you have a situation where you have Muslim men married to even just one wife, and he is not competent, if he's derelict in that particular area, that's a significant problem. Okay, well then to add to that, the, the other problem with that is that you have an influx of women in many of these communities. So if we were to say that until a Muslim man can get, you know, can afford, you know, another wife, then he is not eligible for polygyny. Okay, but then that still leaves us with a significant influx of women um, in the community that cannot get married. So the problem still exists, the problem still remains. And then, I mean, some would argue, well, there were circumstances in which the Prophet ﷺ permitted some of the Sahaba to marry, you know, women, and they were in dire straits financially, or they either, you know, were in dire straits or, or had no money financially. I mean, we all know the famous hadith of the man who, right. you know, Dying. he married right. to a, for the uh, for the Quran, right? right? So, I mean, and, and these are the arguments that, you know, and I'm not saying yay or nay on either side. I'm just trying to get to the bottom of your argument, you know, is that the vast majority of Muslim men here in the West are not deserving of polygyny because, you know, their wives are on public assistance or whatever the case may be, which I do see that to be a big problem. That is a big problem. You have cer certain situations where men go after women that are already on public assistance because it makes their burden lighter. You understand what I'm saying? The onus on them is very light because I don't really have to pay for her you know, food or I don't have to pay for her apartment because she has Section 8. I don't have to pay for her food because she gets food stamps. So that area is, is very easy on me. You know, So then it's like, okay, well, what part of you are you exerting you know, to be the koama if everything else is taken care of? So you know, I pretty much got that point. Um, the the I mean, the, the, the point that I'm making is that you said that the, the your words were the true reason why many Muslim women are, are unwilling to agree to their respective husbands taking on multiple wives. And that is because you feel like they are not deserving. The women feel that they are not deserving of that. And then you listed a number of areas where um, Muslim men are weak in. And those areas like the politics, political, elaborate a little bit on that. Right. I think that's very important. Right. Um, there are certain competencies that I specifically detailed referring to um, Hawaii, right? One of the things that I mentioned was intelligence, of being of a certain, being basically having some type of intellectual prowess in which you are uh, projecting uh, like yourself, like having a clear mind, have, having uh, uh, positive thoughts, and having a positive outlook on yourself and your community, all of those things, and just using the intellect that Allah gave us, right? Okay. In, in all of our aspects, whether it be religious, financial, or whatever. And then I mentioned knowledge, having uh, a competent knowledge of Islam. So, as you mentioned, right, a lot of times brothers, they, and like I said, this is not just a fault of the brothers as well. A lot of brothers, they seek out, like you said, they seek out women to lighten their responsibility. A lot of brothers, they purposely seek out women who are less knowledgeable Islamically than they are, so that if a woman doesn't know her rights, it makes, him, makes it easy for him to manipulate her. Yes, absolutely. And this is actually something that's very negative, but it happens, right? So having integrity, right? Referring to like having the knowledge of Islam and living what we know, right? And what we mentioned about um, politics of having some type of control or dominance in your political sphere of making sure that um, your community is thriving and if your, your community is doing well and that your community is not being externally negatively influenced. Um, and some other things that I mentioned as well referring to finances. Finance, I mentioned yeah, Wealth, thing. sexuality, and humor. Right. <laughs> so um, I mentioned um, finances of being, making sure that you're able to do what the law says, making sure that your wife doesn't have to go out and ask the community for something because she shouldn't have to. You know, so, because that's the ideal, and we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Absolutely. So, it's, it, in other words, like it's no justification ha that a Muslim who's married to a, even a, even if a woman is not Muslim, even if she's a Jew or a Christian, 
she still has a right to be maintained. And there's no justification for you to just not purposely not make yourself able-bodied to go into the workforce and seek out the halal bounties that Allah set forth. I mentioned sexuality specifically because it seems that that's, for a lot of brothers, that's the only competency that they want to be competent in. So you have like a lot of situations where a lot yeah, of I think that has a lot to do with the, the black male stigma that you know he's the bull, he's gonna impregnate all of the women and you know that's a whole nother one of the conversation, <laughs> to be honest. That's his own segment, right. to be honest. Right. But yeah, like um yeah, sexual competency, that's obviously as we mentioned before, that's obviously important in a marriage, because again the word Nikali means sexual intercourse by definition, right? And then I mentioned humor that Women, they enjoy when a man can make them make them laugh, make them feel good, make them feel joyful. No one wants like a dull, stiff husband who has like a poor sense of humor. We know, we know the best example, the Prophet said, he was noted for having a very colorful sense of humor. And when he would laugh, it was reports that he laughed so loudly that you could see his molar teeth, which showed that he had a very genuine, colorful sense of humor. So all of these things combined are what are required to establish true power, and we're lacking in all of those areas. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why I mentioned that a lot of Muslim women are averse to a man taking multiple wives is that we're not competent in those areas that I mentioned. We're, we don't have any control over the intellectual conversation concerning how Islam is rejected in the media and the public. Absolutely. In fact, we have Al-Wali Ibn Talal, one of the wealthiest Muslims in human history, He's one of the main financiers of News Corp, which owns Fox News, which is the most Islamophobic media outlet in the history of journalism. Absolutely. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, what say us about that? You know? So things like that is that we stab ourselves in the back, and then and again, you look around the world and you see the atrocities that are occurring in the Muslim world, and you see Muslim women getting killed, getting raped, and you see Muslim men are powerless to do anything about this. And I mean, if, if you're a Muslim woman and you see this, you're, you're, you're probably thinking like, okay, how are you going to protect this? You know, so it's, it's those type of things. If you're, if you're not competent in the workforce, if you don't have stable employment for yourself, you can't protect our home. You can't prevent us from getting evicted. You can't keep my belly full. You can't keep the belly of my children full. These are very important issues. And also one of the other things that I um, also mentioned, domestic violence is a huge problem yeah. that we refuse to speak about. That, that, is, that here again is a whole other issue uh, for the Maradia show. And we're actually going to do uh, a segment on that, on the domestic violence piece, because it is very prevalent in the Muslim world and in many Islamic households, and it is not being addressed. Um, to go back to the, the piece that you mentioned of um, Muslim men not really dominating the, you know, the conversation or the discussion from an intellectual standpoint about Islam and the position of Islam, uh, as well as um, the religious competency. You find you know, many Muslim men, including imams and dadis and students of knowledge, um, being very weak in their, you know, in their ability to you know, perform <coughs> you know, Islamically the way that they are supposed to, or to the standard in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds them, uh, financially, sexually, and, and in terms of their humor. With all of these things, um, the Muslim male being lacking in these things, let's just say for the sake of argument that the Muslim male was, you know, financially competent, intellectually apt, um, you know, sexually equipped, if all, and, the if all, all of those things were fulfilled, would the woman still be averse or opposed to polygyny? I would, I would dare to argue that she would be less averse. And the reason why I say I would dare to say, because we know that even during the time of the Prophet, the wives of the Prophet, they displayed jealousy, even to the extent we know in the, in, in, in the Sahih of Bukhari, in which Muhammad he was with one of his wives, and one of the servants of his other wives brought food to her home. And she knocked the food on the floor because she didn't want Muhammad to eat the food of his other wife. So these things play out. So it's not like jealousy doesn't exist or people vying for the affection of another. It's not like those things don't exist. But if you're competent in those six companies that I competencies that I mentioned, you have much less of a justification to say absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Because we're human beings, right? We we have these intuitions, we have these instincts that Allah has given us, right? But then also, we have guidance. 
which is to mandate and to regulate how we feel and how we express those feelings. Because there's a proper way to display jealousy and there's an incorrect way to display jealousy. So when we have those competencies that I mentioned set in place, obviously dictated by the guidance of Islam, you'll find that there will be significantly less reasons why someone would be averse to something. What do you believe? I agree. I agree. Uh, and you'll find that most of the time when a brother brings home this idea that I want to take another wife, the first thing in, in my years of counseling, the first thing the woman says is that we can't afford another wife. You know, we can't afford this. And most of the time, if the brother is financially, you know, capable of taking on another wife, then the argument will be, well, we don't even spend time together ourselves, you know, and then you're gonna bring somebody else, so it's, it's time, or it's money, or it's, you know, this, or that, or, you know, it's always going to be something. But as you stated, if these um, areas are actually being fulfilled, then she's not going to be as averse as she would be if these excuses existed. And, and I agree with that completely. Um, another thing that you mentioned is that, um, that the weaknesses of the Muslim man in these areas, you know, basically puts him in a situation where the Muslim women actually lose respect for him and feel like he does not deserve polygyny. Okay, so how do we solve that problem? How does the Muslim male become more intelligent, more religious, uh, more politically aware and, you know, astute? more wealthy financially, more sexually equipped and, and, and to create more humor. How do we solve or how do we fix this deficit? That's, that's the question. That's not an easy question to answer because there are individual answers. We have to look in the mirror and we have to reflect what type of Muslim am I right now? What type of Muslim do I hope to be? That each and every one of us, all one point something billion of us have to do that self-reflection, regardless of what station or stage or degree that Allah has placed us. All of us have to come to terms with the fact that I am sufficient in everything. I am competent in nothing. I hope to be competent in something. Because a lot of times we feel that we're competent in everything and the reality is that we're not competent in anything. We're insufficient in everything. And we know that as human beings, we'll never be 100%. But we need to be at least 90%. We have no excuse to not be 90%. Now, again, pertaining to the actual question is that we have to look inside ourselves to see what am I deficient in? We need to have an honest conversation with ourselves. To, and, and no one is gonna do that for us because we have the promise of Allah. Allah says Allah does not change the condition of the people unless they change what is in themselves. It's just like if you're the star of a movie or a TV show. You can have the greatest supporting cast ever, but you're the star. You have to be the star of your, this, this life is like our TV show, our movie. Our narration. If, exactly, if we don't make it happen, it's not gonna happen. You can have the best supporting cast ever. If you don't memorize your lines and perform, you're not gonna get the Emmy. You're not gonna get the Oscar. Our Oscar is Jenna, right? We want the Oscar. <laughs> that's the accolade that we want, right? Right, right? But you have to play the role. You got the best supporting cast ever. If you don't play the role, you're not gonna get the the, 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 the acclaim of, of, of the paradise. And that's the objective, right? But just like they say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And just like Allah says, the Prophet Allah says, he has purchased the, the, the possessions and the lives of the, of the believers in exchange for the paradise. So there's a lot of work that we have to do, including those companies and just competencies and just competencies that Allah has mentioned. We have to go back to the drawing board for us as men first because we have been placed as the leaders of the people. And if we are correct, everyone else is gonna follow suit with Allah's mission. But if we're faulty, everything else is gonna be like a house of cards. And, and, and the Ummah, unfortunately, is a house of cards. bothering me. As a non-Muslim, did you know about polygyny? And when you first heard about polygyny, from a non-Muslim's perspective, what, what did you think about the concept of polygyny? I mean, to be honest, other than the name, I really didn't know anything about it. I didn't really learn about what polygyny was until I became Muslim, to be honest. 
So like, that's just, yeah, I, that was just like something that wasn't even in my psyche. It was just, it was just something, a word that I heard of vaguely in casual conversation.